So you guys really know what you're talking about, and I suspect that what I'm going to talk about today should, I hope, be very obvious to a lot of you guys. When last week, actually two weeks ago, Kevin Systrom came and, and talked to my team, and one of the things that he said was he'd always thought that growth was about these big step changes, right? You go into a new country, you open up beyond um, like high schoolers or whatever it is. And one of the things that the growth team at Facebook does that, that he said he learned from us is that we focus on the details and that small wins really, really matter and aggregate to a big thing. So even though a lot of this is simple and obvious, I think it's hard. And hopefully with the experience that I have from working at Facebook, working at eBay, I actually paid for college doing paid search arbitrage and SEO and affiliates, so I really do come from the dark side of the force. Um, with that experience, hopefully I can hammer home with you guys how important it is to focus on just a few things that really matter. So at the core of what matters most for growth, the truth of the matter is it's retention. You can't have a successful product if your users don't stick around. And so many products, and this is so obvious, right? So many products I've seen, and so many companies I've seen, and so many teams inside Facebook that I've worked with to help them drive growth, drive the growth of their product, promote their product, try to get people to install their app before it is ready for prime time, before it has product market fit. And the way we look at product market fit on the growth team at Facebook is this chart. On the x-axis is number of days from acquisition, number of days since you installed an app. On the y-axis is the percent of people who are monthly active. You could put daily active, you could put quarterly active, you could put whatever on it. I find monthly active works for pretty much everything. For the first 30 days after you've been acquired, shockingly, everyone is 30 days active. That makes sense, right? And then on day 31, a certain percent are active, day 32, a certain percent are active, day 33, a certain percent are active. And for Facebook, this is super easy. So I joined Facebook when we had 50 million users, 60 million users, and we were acquiring 100,000 plus users a day. So my data set was pretty good that I was getting the chance to work with, and we as a team got the chance to work with. Actually, a guy called Danny Ferrante was a huge part of how we got really good at understanding retention and growth for Facebook, who runs our data science team now. But for the advertiser products, which we were growing at the same time, that had only launched in September 2007. And I started working on growth for our pages product and our advertiser product in October, November 2007. And for that product, we had 10,000, 20,000 people who'd ever signed up. So we had a very, very small data set. And we had to figure out what our lifetime value was going to be for our customers based on just two months, three months of data. And so what we did was this. We looked at everyone who had been on the system for one day, everyone who had been on the system for at least two days, everyone who had been on the system for at least three days, how many of them were active on their first day? How many of them were active on their second? Obviously up to 30, it was 100%. Then of everyone who had been on the system 31 days of longer, on their 31st day, what percent of those people were active on day 31? On the 30, their 32nd day, what percent of people who had registered 32 days ago or before were active on their 32nd day, and so on and so forth, out for as long as we had data. And the chart got very noisy out to the right-hand side, but we looked at two different data sets. Number one we looked at was the percent retained, so we could understand how many active advertisers we would have a year or two years out. And number two, we looked at the revenue per customer per day, which produced a chart that looked like this as well. And in a really healthy business, it actually slopes up. And I've seen that in a number of the companies that I've advised because they bring more cities online. Think about Uber, right? I have nothing to do with Uber. So conceptually, though, when Uber only had a few cities, people could only drive cars in a few cities. You add on London, international travelers can take it. You add on Paris, international travelers can take it. So those same customers can buy in more places. So actually, for them, the revenue goes up. For social businesses, sometimes you see the retention curve goes up because you have network effects. When your friends get onto Facebook, you are much more likely to come to Facebook every single day than when your friends are not on Facebook. When your friends or your mom or the most important to people to you in your life are on WhatsApp or Messenger or WeChat or Line or Kakao or any of these applications, you're much more likely to use it every single day or every single month. And so often network effects drive it up. But at an absolute minimum, these things have to go flat. So using that analysis, we were able, for Facebook's advertising business with just 10, 20,000 active advertisers, to predict what the one-year lifetime value of an advertiser was, and therefore how much money, how much inventory we had to spend to acquire those customers. This is very, very simple. Very simple. But the number of teams and companies that I've worked with who go out there and try and 
promote their product really hard while that blue line is still sloping towards the x-axis and at some point will intercept and then are surprised when the growth of their company fails, churn overwhelms new user acquisition and resurrection and their company starts shrinking is tremendously high. So if there's one thing to take away from me, from what we on the Facebook growth team, Javi, Naomi, Danny, Chamoth who founded the team, all of us have learned over the last eight years of working on growth at Facebook and all the companies that Facebook has acquired and all the products that Facebook has built is product market fit is the only thing that matters to growth. And the best way we have found to be able to measure product market fit is do you end up with a retention line that asymptotes to a line parallel to the x-axis? Another thing that a lot of people talk to me about is like, okay, great, so <laughs> you're at Facebook, you've got all this data, you've worked with all these different companies, like how do I know what a good retention rate is for my industry? Because for eBay, the retention rate we needed was a very different level to the retention rate we needed for advertising for Facebook to the retention rate we needed for Facebook, right? You look at a company like WhatsApp, and WhatsApp has over, I can't even remember what the last number we announced was. Messenger has over 600 million active users, um, and WhatsApp has hundreds of millions too. And you can actually take a look and say how many people have smartphones, how many people have Androids and iPhones in the world. Those numbers are out there. I don't know how many outside of China is, one, 1.3 billion, whatever. How many people are on the internet? Two, 2.3 billion out of China. So you can say, if everyone with a smartphone has installed Facebook, if everyone with a smartphone has installed Messenger, what percentage of them were retained? And then you know the retention rate has to be better because we haven't got everyone to install Facebook or Messenger. And I love this as an example, and it's completely gratuitous, but I absolutely love it. There's this guy, Jeffrey Taylor. Have any of you heard of Jeffrey Taylor? That is a good sign. No one has seen me give this presentation before. You have. Jeffrey Taylor is awesome. He won the Nobel Prize for Physics. He was at a college called Trinity at Cambridge, but I forgive him for that. And he was uh, an expert in um, various things, quantum physics specifically. And he uh, did this analysis using this picture that was published in, I believe it was Life magazine that doesn't exist anymore in 1950. And it's one of the Trinity nuclear bomb tests. And there's this thing in physics, and I studied physics, and, and then, as I say, transitioned to the dark side of the force and became a marketer. And it's called dimensional reasoning. And what you can do is look at any physical uh, uh, constant or, or force or whatever you're trying to, to analyze. And in this case, you're trying to analyze power, right? And that's force times the distance over which it's worked, uh, energy. So newtons times meters. And you can decompose something to the basic dimensions it comes from. And so newtons is kilograms times meters per second squared. And then you add in meters. And so the, me the metrics that add up to, uh, to power are kilograms meters squared seconds to the minus two. So how do you get mass from this? The volume of the sphere is approximately equal to the mass. And so he throws in another meters cubed. So now you've got meters cubed times meters squared over seconds to the minus two. So you've got meters to the five over seconds to the minus two. And you have a time here and you have a distance here. And just plugging in those metrics, he was able to do two things. One, find out the force of the US atomic bomb to within a factor of two using just a propaganda picture. And two, find out the ratio of the powers of the most powerful US and Russian atomic bombs because both countries were publishing their data. And that was the top secret in the world. Figuring out how well Facebook retains versus eBay retains versus all the other companies out there retain as all of us publish our numbers is a lot easier than that. And so it's very important. Understand the retention of your product and then understand for the market that you're going after what good retention looks like. And that will put you in a place where you truly understand do you have product market fit and how well positioned are you to compete in your market. And you can do it with very small amounts of data if you use that technique I showed on the first page. So product market fit matters. When I asked um, Keith and, and Ben yesterday what was probably the most valuable thing for this audience, uh, they said it was, when do I think about building a growth team? How should I organize for growth? What should my company org structure look like to work on growth? The most important thing to know about how Mark did this at Facebook is he was the growth team for the first 50 to 100 million users. He was the growth team. 
We have this thing people have talked about in public called lockdown, where the company sort of basically stays in the office for a long period. We haven't had a company-wide lockdown for a long time, thank God. Um, but the idea for lockdown came when Mark and Dustin wanted to go into a new college. And they realized they didn't have enough servers and they didn't have enough money. So they had to rewrite the data store for Facebook so that we would be able to support more users with the same number of servers. And the company just stayed there and focused. And there's a really good example in the Facebook effect, the, the Kirkpatrick book, which I don't know if you guys have read. It's very good if you want to know about the early days of Facebook, where he talks about how we went into different colleges. And we would launch in every college within 50 miles of one where there was a successful competitor, win in all of those colleges, and then launch in the college in the center to compete. These were not strategies that a growth team came up with. These were strategies that Mark came up with, and Dustin came up with, and the leadership of the company came up with way before we had a team called marketing or growth. And one thing that I see very, very regularly is CEOs dump the responsibility for growth onto some person who doesn't know that much about what's in their heart about the company, what is their goal for the company, and the company isn't ready to hire a growth team. In the early days of most companies, Series A, Series B, when you have funding, you have some level of product market fit, the only thing you should be focused on is growing what matters for your business, and that means it's the CEO's responsibility to drive growth. And you shouldn't be thinking about hiring a growth team until you have a good operating model of growth happening for your company, and then you need someone like me to come along and optimize the crap out of it. Something else that Mark did incredibly well that I can't overemphasize enough is he focused the company. And to this day, the first metric that he presents when we talk about our company metrics and what our goals are for the next half is connecting the world. How many monthly and daily active people will there be on Facebook? Every single company out there has a simple number they are trying to drive at the core of their company. And Chamoth talked many times inside the team about simplifiers and complexifiers. And there are teams I've worked with who have literally had a square root in their metric because they felt they needed to properly normalize statistically the number they were going after. And they were trying to grow the number of people who had pages on Facebook. How the hell they got a square root in that metric, I have no idea, rather than just number of active page admins. But people get too clever about this stuff. Right? I come from a physics background. I love complicated metrics that are hard to measure and require lasers. The core metric for Facebook is monthly active people. How do we get everyone in the world connected? Our mission is to make the world more open and connected. To do that, we need the world on Facebook. We could have how many connections as a metric. We could have how much revenue we generate as a metric. We could have so many different metrics and we focused on that one metric and it makes a big difference because if you don't have a clear guiding North Star of a metric you are trying to get to, lots of people can do work that they feel is good for your company, and they can all be right, but they're not all aligned. So one person might be saying, the thing we need to keep our company alive, the thing we need for Facebook to be successful, the thing we need for Airbnb to be successful, Uber to be successful is revenue. Right? We need money, because without money we're going to burn through the cash we have in the bank, and we are going to be out of here. And they're absolutely right. Someone else might be saying, our mission is to connect the world. We need to get everyone friends. Someone else might be saying, if you're Airbnb, we need to have the maximum nights booked. We need to get hotels on this platform so we can have more different venues that people can go after. But the fact of the matter is, all of those people are right. And if the company doesn't have a guiding North Star metric, this is cool, it's a North Star, and then the thing's going around, it's very cool. If the company doesn't have a guiding North Star metric to go after, everyone who's right will be pulling in different directions and the entire company will go nowhere. And it will go nowhere and it will fight itself. And so Mark had a drumbeat. MAP, 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 and now DAP, 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 DAP. Monthly active people, daily active people. One single metric, one single thing the whole company focuses on. So the CEO is the growth person until you have solid growth that you understand and then you can put a team against it to optimize it. Or you've reached a scale where you can't do it yourself 
and you need a clear metric so you can align the entire company behind you to all be driving in that one direction. And once you have that set up in your company, you're in a good place. Now we created the growth team at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, because Facebook stopped growing. And there's a number of sort of fairly public stories about that. Um, Chamath's talked about it, Zuck's talked about it, Cheryl has. And one of the things we did when we set it up was understand what was that moment where you went, okay, I get it, I love Facebook. And for us, it was the moment when you found your friends. And we had this huge discussion internally because we saw a strong correlation between number of friends and percent active. And there was this huge conversation internally about whether it was causal or whether it was correlated. And again, the most valuable thing we did was a very, very simple, and it was Zuck again, which is we had this huge fight going on between sort of data science, data analytics, engineering, products, marketing, and like couldn't get to a decision and couldn't do anything. And Mark simplified down and said, get everyone to 10 friends in 14 days. And when we took on that problem, we significantly moved by a double digit percentage, the number of people who got to 10 friends in 14 days and retention. And so we clearly moved the numbers we cared the most about, but we've been arguing tremendously about whether even to move that number first. And I love the show House. Do you guys like the show House? It may be because there's a British person in it. Um, but I love the show House, and he's got this whole thing, test by treating. Well, it turns out making that change happen was the thing that told us whether the change mattered. When we broke people you may know and growth went negative, we finally realized people you may know really mattered for Facebook's growth. And fine, every social site does it now, LinkedIn, Twitter. Keith has some excellent stories about growth at LinkedIn. He really knows this stuff very well. He's super humble. Um, but like, cutting the Gordian knot and making the decision to move forward was the most valuable thing that Mark did for the growth team because it took the shackles off us and allowed us to just say, fine, we're gonna get people connected to their friends. And that was the magic moment for Facebook. The magic moment for eBay is when you find that one item that you're looking for that you couldn't find on any other site. A collectible was what it was really about in my day, but there was also cars, which was fascinating. People would find that car that they were looking that was perfect, that they couldn't get from the showroom anymore or whatever. And so people's eyes would light up and they'd be retained. And we actually shifted when I was at eBay from landing paid search clicks on the registration form to landing them on the search results form because that moment that they saw the item they were looking for made them much more likely to be retained when they signed up so even though we got net less acquisitions and less confirmations, we got net more active users and more revenue by landing marketing on search results pages rather than the registration form. Again, everywhere I have been involved in advising or working, there is a magic moment. There is a thing about your product that people love and their eyes light up and you often find that qualitatively and then you can back it up with correlations in the data and it's very hard to prove causally, especially when you're very small and don't have a lot of data and people will argue and argue and argue about it and the best way to find out if they're right is break it or make it move up tremendously and then see what happens. So I wanna give a few examples of tactics too and then hopefully um, I will leave a little bit more time for questions um, or Keith can kick me off the stage and get you guys to your coffee quicker. Um, but I want to talk about tactics that really matter. But first, to pause and go over. Retention, product market fit, is the most important thing for growth. The way to measure that is having solid retention. And that's the single most important thing that you need to take away from today. You can figure out the retention that matters for your market by looking at everyone else. And when you organize for growth, growth is the CEO's problem for a very, very, very long time, far further than most people think it's their problem. And if the CEO shows a clear North Star that everyone can align behind, you will have a company that drives you towards your metrics. So tactics. Marketing is a dirty word in the valley. That's why there are now growth teams. I'm not a growth person, I'm an online marketer. I learned how to do online marketing at eBay in 2004, and that was an incredible team. There's Mike Osborne, who does online marketing at Uber right now. There's John Coral, who's president of Neiman Marcus, both the stores and the offline. Matt Madrigal, CTO of Fanatics. Chris Orton, CEO of Fanatics. There's just this amazing, Matt Ackley, CMO of Marin Software. There's this amazing group of people who blew out of the eBay online marketing team at that side, and none of us really have the same title anymore because we're kind of embarrassed, it says marketing. But in the end, growth is marketing. 
And so many computer scientists, product managers think this is the way the world works. You build this better product, and remember, like a 10% change in efficiency of something or whatever can be completely fundamentally game-changing in any market. You build this fundamentally better product, and then don't tell anyone about it, and expect it to grow. Turns out that doesn't happen. My favorite example from the last year across all my departments, so I run uh, analytics, online marketing, and uh, internationalization for Facebook, and I, I recently took on internationalization, and China, uh, India is incredibly important to Facebook's growth. And Hindi, that says Hindi, I didn't know that either, Hindi is the fourth largest language on earth. And we were at this stage where Hindi was growing very, 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 very slowly. And those are super low numbers. I took off the y-axis because I couldn't get permission to give the numbers out. But those, we were growing very, very, very slowly on Hindi. And then you see there's a little bump. And that bump is when we ran a banner ad inside Facebook and said, do you want to use Facebook in Hindi? So we got a little bump there. But that didn't matter. And then you see the massive angle change in that graph, where it takes off up and to the right. This is going to sound really obvious and really stupid. Most people in the developing world use crappy phones. Like they use feature phones or they use low-end Android. Those phones typically ship with English as their default locale. So we use the default locale to determine which locale we put as the default on the site, English US. We then use the next most popular languages in the country. Next most popular language after US English in India is British English. Jolly good. So we put that second. And then the third one up there is Bengali. I have no idea why Bengali grew so well for us. All the numbers were very low, so it didn't really matter. So we have support for 12 languages professionally translated in India. And we were showing English, English, Bengali, and a more button in English, and wondering why Hindi wasn't growing. So if you look at India and decompose it, right, it's got different states that have different languages. Punjab, Punjabi, right? West Bengal, Bengali. Down, down at the bottom left, you've got Tamil and, and that stuff. Like, so there's this area called the Hindi Crescent. And so by state, we gave a different default language into second position. And that is what happened with that massive change in trajectory of growth that has kept going. And we've quadrupled the number of Hindi users in a year, and it's still going up and to the right today. And what we did was we looked at the data on who was visiting the site. We did qualitative analysis to see what was going on. We built the translations with the Hindi team. And then we changed the site with on-site merchandising. Very, very simple stuff, massive change in the growth curve, and I've seen this over and over again. Um, we, we do donations on the site. Just removing two steps from the conversion flow actually massively changes the conversion rate of the flow, where you can collapse steps into each other. The registration form on the homepage of Facebook is something that Naomi, who's my closest partner in crime, and she's absolutely incredible. She's our VP of product on growth, and she now runs engineering as well. She's brilliant. Like, we took the registration form on Facebook, sounds obvious to you guys now, and we had it one click away from the homepage. We embedded it on the homepage. It was four pages long. We dropped it to seven fields long, and we saw a massive change in conversion rate. The contact importer for Facebook to help people find friends, right? We didn't link to it anywhere on the site. We had optimized the flow tremendously well, and there was no link on the homepage to help you find your friends. We put it in the new user experience flow, and we linked to it from the homepage. This stuff is incredibly obvious, but every one of those was a meaningful win for Facebook's growth. When you have a clear North Star as a company, when the CEO is super clear about where you're trying to go to, when you know what the magic moment is that you want your users to get to as quickly as possible, you take the shackles off the team and you allow them to drive towards what matters most. So think about product market fit as the number one thing that matters for growth. Set a North Star for your company, and then let the team do their work. Should I take some questions now? Take one or two questions. Yeah, there's one in the back. Hi, I wanted to ask if someone came to uh, Facebook and didn't like it and left, what would you do to uh, gain those users? So I think there's a, a, a big question about why people leave. Um, and generally, folks uh, over-index on the idea that people don't like Facebook or don't like the product or whatever and leave. Usually what happens is they don't actually see the value. They don't get to the point at which they see the value. And so we get people signed up. And then 
what we want to happen is we want other people to add them as friends. Like usually everyone goes through a dip. You, you guys look back through your timeline and look what happened for your first year on Facebook. All you did was add friends. We have a product called On This Day, www.facebook.com slash on this day is the easiest way to find it. And if you look on there, every day on my oldest at least, like field for my usage of Facebook, all we have is friend versaries. These are the people you added as friends on that day. And so what truly happens is people come and they go away for a very limited set of reasons. One, we didn't show them their friends. Well, great. Best thing we can do is we have their phone number or their email address, get their friends to use Find Friends on iOS or Android or whatever, and then send friend requests to those people so we can notify them. And then they come back and then they see more and more friends. They get a fuller and fuller news feed and they have a great experience. Two, we didn't confirm a credential or um, in a lot of countries we can't send SMS because we have to pay for SMS so we can't notify them when these things happen. That's a slower ramp up curve. So often it's actually notifying them that there's an opportunity there. Um, but that's really what actually the main reason that people don't ramp up on Facebook and realistically most of leaving Facebook is not leaving, it's not ramping up. And so what we do is optimize on getting them to the magic moment and they're on the site. If they're not on the site, get someone else to send them a friend request, notify them of that. When they come back, get them more friends. And it's very focused and we've stayed that way for eight years and it's really worked. Now, it's hard. On a feature phone in India, that is a lot of work, but it's still the most important thing. Next question. Oh, there's one. There's a few, actually. Have you, have you ever changed your North Star during the course of Facebook? MAP to DAP. We want people to come back daily now. That's it. Okay. Ethan, over there. So, I mean, so today people have hundreds there's of... a mic for you. Oh, sorry. Today people have hundreds of Facebook friends, but um, the younger generation is definitely using it less. So something must have changed in the early calculus of if you have more friends, you use the product more. So if you listen to what I said, I said, if you have friends, you will come back to Facebook. And there are diminishing return curves on anything, right? When we were doing paid search, the more money you spent in a different day, the less incremental return you get for it. So your 500th friend is less valuable for you than your first friend, right? Nothing in your newsfeed to 500 people's worth of stories to 501 people's worth of stories is not as important. For the growth team, where we, and we've, we've actually talked about this at our um, earnings call, like fundamentally on growth, we're doing fine with young people. Um, so for the growth team, we don't focus on that area. What we're focused on is actually getting more active users, and that means focusing on the developing world. So internet.org is a growth team initiative. Um, messaging is a growth team initiative. Making sure that we can get people connected on feature phones using the Facebook for every phone product that was snapped to acquired out of Israel over four years ago now and has more than 100 million active users last time we announced the numbers. Those are where the growth team is focused. Our job is to get people on Facebook monthly and daily and then there is an engagement team to deepen their engagement. And so we have a clear division of resources there. Time for one more question. Uh, uh, so if your metric is DAP, uh, how do you reconcile quality? Like people with 10 accounts, 20 accounts, does that not bother you? Because that would seem to throw off the metric a lot. We actually track uh, duplicate accounts and fake accounts very closely, and we, we release those numbers with our earnings call um, to our best of our knowledge. Um, and so we put those numbers out there, and we try and keep them at a steady level. But we don't go on a complete you know, hunt to take out every single fake account. And there are like three kinds, duplicate, your dog, and um, uh, malicious. And the malicious ones we go after really hard with our site integrity team. And the other ones we just report internally and externally how many we think there are. Um, and we really focus on the positive and how do we grow more users. And we make sure the malicious and spammy stuff is out of the site because that reduces quality of experience and makes people churn if they have a bad experience. But 90% of our focus is on growing the good accounts and then we just monitor what fake is on the site, report it, understand it, make sure it doesn't blow out proportion, but don't spend too much time on the negative, spend all our time on the positive. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Alex.